The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to documentary filmmaker Jeremy Wheelahan, whose new production is now in the wings on a world stage. It's a fairly unambitious idea. Eh, he follows Kevin Spacey and Sam, Sam Mendez through the Bridge Project Company production and world tour of Richard III. Stick around and talk about a house of cards. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media Interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of equity card-carrying Shakespearean actors who don't approve of anyone's version of the bard that they're not in, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Have you seen House of Cards? Kevin Spacey is so deliciously creepy in this Netflix series that I simply can't imagine being around him for more than a few minutes at a time. Of course, I felt that way after The Usual Suspects and then American Beauty, too. But that's just me. Jeremy Wheelahan obviously doesn't share my unease, having worked with Spacey on and off over 20 years. So the idea of shooting a documentary film about a live, modern, year-long touring production of Shakespeare's Richard III, that was the first reunion of Spacey and Sam Mendes since American Beauty, was clearly irresistible to him. Now, in the wings on a world stage, is an extraordinary documenting of Spacey as Richard and much more. Wheelahan gives the viewer unprecedented backstage access to the entire cast as the play is in development and as it winds its way around the world, through big outdoor venues and relatively intimate indoor ones. And Wheelahan, who spent three seasons as associate director of London's Old Vic Theatre Company, where Spacey, Spacey himself has been artistic director for many years, has an excellent sense of what even the casual theatre-goer's mind would find awe in. And you need not know a thing about Richard III or Shakespeare to enjoy this documentary, now available on Netflix and Amazon following its theatrical run. Jeremy Wheelahan, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob. Good to be here. Glad to have you. Um, so let's start with the essential question. Uh, Kevin Spacey, crazy motherfucker or the most misunderstood genius in show business? <laughs> well, uh, wow, that's, um, that's quite a question. Uh, possibly misunderstood, but I don't know if he's mis misunderstood. I mean, he's, he's sort of all over it, Kevin. He's, you know, uh, he, he's quite mysterious. I'll, gi I'll give you that much. Uh, and and he's uh, he's very much a an actor who appears in sort of on every front really whether it's films uh, you know this this work on Netflix with with House of Cards um, or uh, recently I, th I believe he did a, a a video game computer game 
So he's he's pretty ubiquitous these days. He, he is everywhere, and I think uh, he uh, very brilliantly over the course of his career seems to have sort of cultivated uh, a sort of very private and uh, and sort of somewhat enigmatic presence in the in the media world. So it was it was quite interesting to uh, to set about working with him and making a documentary, um, which would which would uh, you know follow him for the best part of a year uh, while he's at work in the theater, in the dressing room, and touring to all these countries. But, you know, he's a, he's, he's a brilliantly talented actor, Kevin. He's a very, very successful and powerful figure in the, in the entertainment industry, uh, and, and also, I think, quite influential, and, and seems to find himself, uh, more often than not, on the sort of front of the wave of, of uh, you know, uh, innovation, really, whether, on, whether technological innovation, like this... Netflix uh, sort of arrangement with House of Cards, or you know whether it's at the Old Vic Theatre, treading the boards, or running a theatre company in Ireland, or you know his his very highly acclaimed and and uh, for what he's most famous, I suspect uh, his film career. You know, so he he is uh, he's a complicated, uh, dynamic, uh, and pretty prodigious fella, that's for sure. And it was fascinating to uh, to follow him with a camera for so long, but uh, but fortunately, I think that was facilitated by a very long-standing sort of working relationship that he and I uh, have sort of evolved over the past 15, 20 years. Well, when you were mentioning all of his variety of talents and uh, things he's done, you missed the one that I saw last week completely by accident on Facebook. Apparently there's a, a video clip of him playing the harmonica with Billy Joel and a all-star cast on stage. And uh, it's just like, what in the world? What, what can this guy not do? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, he he is amazing. I mean, he, you know, he's got a many many talents, and it isn't limited to. I mean, it isn't limited to just acting. I mean, he can sing. I worked on a film with him in two thousand and three, two thousand and four, uh, which was a, a biopic of the singer Bobby Darren, and he sang all the music for that. Uh, the the soundtrack of which was nominated, I think, for a Grammy. Uh, you know, he did a tour then with a full big band and the whole bells and whistles, and toured. The U.S. and, and some other places. Um, he he he's known to wheel out a, a, an incredibly astute sort of uh, impersonation, or you know, I mean, he's 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 a brilliantly talented and gifted performer, Kevin, and uh, and he, he likes to explore that. I think in every way that he possibly can, and he's not afraid to do that, whether on stage or in film or in television or online or wherever it goes, you know. Uh, and I think and I think people really respond to that, you know. So as much time as you've spent with him leading up to this project, you you decided, well, I mean, you were comfortable with spending this much time following him around with a camera that you didn't have concerns about, uh, that he might not be comfortable with that much exposure, for example, or that he would be he would be a good candidate. I mean, a year is a long time to be in and out of somebody's life with a camera. It's true. I mean, you know, of course, and, and I think not just Kevin, but the rest of the company, the other 19 actors who were there, part of this company, and the crew, and everybody else. I mean, I think, I suspect any filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, who's going into uh, such an intimate environment, and a professional environment, a working environment, and creative environment, with Kevin, and with the rest of the company, and cast, and crew, there's a certain element of earning confidence and trust there, and, and communicating that, and, and finding a way to do that, to dance that dance. Um, I think with Kevin, I, I was very, uh, you know, my, my, Kevin and I have known each other for a long time. We've worked together a lot over the past sort of 15, 20 years. And I think that made it very, uh, you know, I mean, I think that is kind of the reason I got to, to make this film, really. I, you know, Kevin was comfortable with me. He was, he, we'd worked together a lot closely, uh, both in theater and uh, on feature films. Um, he, when I came to him and, and told him I wanted to make this film, you know, having heard that he was doing this play and doing it with Sam and they were touring around the world, he responded very positively. He loved the idea and I think he liked the idea of me doing it. So, so in terms of access, in terms of knowing Kevin well enough to know, you know, I mean, I think it'd be very different if I was somebody who, who had no relationship with him whatsoever and I turned up with cameras and was on the tour. I think that would have been a very different dynamic and and in a way, not just with Kevin, but I think with the rest of the company, just the the slow unfolding of things and this you know I was with them for so long, me and my crew were with them for the best part of a year, I mean ten months, and so really over the ask 
you know, in a way, these guys all none of these guys knew each other beforehand. So they all came together from various different backgrounds and ages and experiences. Half of them were American, half of them were, were British. So I think us arriving into that as well sort of sort of became part of the uh, fabric and the glue, and everyone was on a process of, of sort of feeling everybody else out. So, um, you know, it, it, it could have gone horribly wrong, and definitely there were some of the actors uh, who were more reticent and more reluctant to be filmed uh, for, the, for the project than, than, than others. But over the course of time, I think, uh, and I hope the film shows, you know, everyone really came together and supported the project and, and offered an awful lot and were very magnanimous and generous in their, in their time with it. Uh, tell me about the chicken and egg aspect of this. I mean, what came first? Was it the idea that, uh, that he and Sam were going to do a play uh, and, and uh, mount it and then tour it around the world? Or was it the idea of to do a documentary about a play and then the play developed? I mean, what, was, what came first? No, the, I mean, the, the play very much came first. Uh, and the film came, came uh, as a result of them doing this. So it was something I want to document. So for the, that year and the two years previous, Sam uh, had produced and directed in, in, in sort of uh, in partnership with the Old Vic Theatre, Kevin's Theatre, and the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York, they had put together this thing called the Bridge Project. And the idea, I think, was... You know, Sam was a sort of British director living in the U.S. Kevin was a an American actor living in the U.K. They're both very deeply involved in theatre. They had this remarkably successful collaboration in film together before. And and then I think with that and Sam's relationship with uh, Joe Melillo at Brooklyn Academy of Music at BAM, the idea formed to sort of create this transatlantic theatre company who would open in London or in New York and close in the other city and somewhere in between tour it to the world and, and see if they could take it out and find partners around the world. And so that, ha- that took place for, for the, the Richard III project was the third year of the Bridge project, um, and it was the final year. Uh, so, so there was already sort of an established way of doing it and touring in this way, and then when, when Sam and Kevin decided to do Richard III, and take it around the world, they found, you know, other partners around the world to tour it to. So they visited, I think, 12 cities in total, you know, uh, outside of London and New York. Um, So very much, I mean, the the thing that came first was this idea of Sam and Joe's uh, and Kevin's to to do the Bridge Project. And that had run for two years before uh, Kevin did Richard III. And then when I knew he was doing that, I just was like, you know, for me it felt like, for me, it felt like a, a kind of unique opportunity. My experience with Kevin at the Old Vic, you know, as an associate director there, as an assistant director there, you know, understanding the dynamic of a company and getting to know Kevin that well and, and, and the Old Vic, who, who I'd have to work with to make this film. So that combined with my sort of main, main career, which is in, in feature films and film work. So it felt to me like I had the insight and I had the access, I had the confidence in Kevin. And so if he could grant the access and we could raise money, this could be quite an interesting film on live theatre. I, I, I'm not really hugely aware of many documentaries that go into the process uh, uh, of live theatre and certainly not a tour of this nature and of this scale, you know. Um, uh, Bruce Guthrie, the uh, assistant director on the play, described it, uh, you know, sort of as blockbuster theatre. When you have someone like Kevin and someone like Sam and Shakespeare and you're touring it to all these places, it's not something that happens very often, sadly. Uh, uh, and so to document that was, was the key uh, that, I, that I brought to Kevin. And, uh, and thankfully we got to make this film. Now I'm thinking you could probably do an equally interesting film if you were to just um, document its initial production in where, whatever city it started in, London or New York, and with someone like Kevin and Sam, and you'd probably have enough material for a good two-hour documentary right there. But then when you add the element of the touring, and then you have you know the exotic locations, you have them on the boat, you have them in Australia, you have them in uh, where are they in China? I mean, I'm trying to. Uh, China and the you know the, the, in the desert in the Saudi desert. I mean, it was it was a, quite a whirlwind. I mean, in some ways, this film you know is, is a kind of an adventure story on some level. You know that aspect of it. You know the, the sort of travel and the the sort of adventure that they all went on. Um, 
Uh, and so marrying that aspect of it with the theatre production and the story of the play and the story of this production coming together and, and growing and becoming what it was in front of audiences was sort of the, the, the two sort of poles, really, of the film that I tried to, to embroider together, you know. Now, I would, I would guess that if I was playing to – if I, being Mr. Media, was playing more towards a uh, – uh, a British or a UK audience, we, I'd probably be giving uh, Gemma Jones more uh, uh, play here. Uh, she's obviously a very big star. Uh, is not the focus of the film, but we, for American audiences, we get a good glimpse of her and a good sense of uh, you know how she manages to charm her audiences and uh, the the respect that so much of this cast held her in, right? Well, I mean, you know, what, Gemma. I mean, where do you even start? She's she is extraordinary. I think Chuck or one of the one of the British actors is like she's one step away from being a dame, and you know, she really is. She's a beautiful and incredible uh, individual, and then an extraordinary talented and, and sort of generous and and you know heartfelt actor. I think um, she was. I mean, she was just such an asset to the company in a whole, uh, to the production, to the, to, you know, in the theatre, to the work, but also, I think, as part of the family and, and a sort of, you know, this sort of brilliantly fun, sort of ribald, incredible sense of humour and, uh, and brilliant sort of charm and energy that she brought to it. Um, and, you know, in the, in the, and I hope we get a, a sense of that in the film. I mean, that was one of the things is, you know, whilst many people were hoping this would be a, a sort of Kevin Spacey expose or a film on Kevin, and and it very much there is that element to it. I really wanted to make this film about the company, and 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 so throughout the film we get to meet everyone, and and, and uh, you know, and Gemma, you know, she she's a star and always will be in her own right. I mean, she she if she didn't have us all in stitches laughing, she had us all in shreds with her performance. Uh, she she was quite a character, and as as, as she mentions in the film, film, you know, she did a similar tour 40, 30, 40 years beforehand in the seven, early 70s, you know, very, very successful and famous production of Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream, which toured for nine months around the world and uh, was still today is very, very highly considered and, and a sort of groundbreaking production. So for her, you know, for the younger actors on the, on the, in the company, she was a huge character and figure and, and um, yeah, Gemma, I mean, I miss her. She we became, we, she said, started off being very reticent and reluctant about me and pointing cameras and whatever the hell was going on. She didn't know, but uh, I'm pleased to say that she she uh, she 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 melted a little bit, and uh, and and um, uh, I'm very glad to, to feel that she's become a bit of a friend. She's she's someone I really respect and, and love a lot, and a bit of a flirt too, where she uh, tells the camera that oh, she'd yeah. like to see the uh, that young man without his clothes on. Oh yeah, no. She, I'm telling you, she is she is full of mischief. That lady, that girl, <laughs> mischief and humor, and definitely nonstop flirtation. It was, uh, it, it's quite, it's quite a joy to be around. <laughs> so uh, you're mounting a, a documentary that's going to take ten months. Let's just call it a year. We'll we'll give you the two months. Uh, how do you get funding for that? I mean, you're taking a, 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 your, your crew. I, I assume you've got several people with you who are part of the documentary crew on top of the the, uh, the stage production, of course, and you're going to be touring. You're going to have to pay their expenses. On top of all the technical costs of mounting a documentary, you've got travel, you've got uh, food, you've got a, you know, all the stuff that's coming with them. Where do you get the money for that? Or did Kevin and Sam fund this, perhaps? Probably not. <laughs> Well, it was, it was, it was, I mean, the project, the genesis of the whole project and actually getting it moving, getting people behind and getting it funded. And, you know, you'd love to think, you flick a switch and here's an idea and let's go and do it. So, I mean, it's a slightly boring and, and complicated sort of journey, how the whole thing, and we, we actually, we sort of shot it and, and did it in stages, really. So there was a number of different budgets and each time we'd move forward and, and, uh, and almost like separate productions, you know, um, yeah, early on, before there was really anything in place, any money or anything formal, you know, I, Kevin and Sam graciously allowed me into the rehearsal room for a couple of days, just me and my camera. Um, you know, it was it was right at the, about I think about two weeks, I think about two months into the London run uh, before they went on tour and before they went up doors, before the financing got resolved and, and we could we we budgeted and, and sort of cleared. Uh, the, the sort of week shoot in Greece, which for me, 
for me, that really sort of pushed it because I felt like if we couldn't get something green and cleared um, for, for the week in Greece, it, to me, it felt like, you know, we were really losing a sort of backdrop and a context and a sort of part of the story that was really necessary. So thankfully, that, cut, that imminence of that arriving sort of forced things to come together. And, uh, and yeah, thankfully, we, we sort of bridged our way through and, and uh, you know, managed to pay for the whole thing. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a big part of the challenge, really, was to put these things together. Kevin was hugely instrumental in that and, uh, uh, and was huge helpful and supportive and, and really got the ball rolling I think would be fair to say what what did you wind up spending to make the film millions and millions of pennies <laughs> god I mean you know I, I think I mean th- details like that you know they, they it was it, I think we did very well for uh, for the budget we had and uh, all the countries and all of the tour you know all of what 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 you see in the film and it was also sort of a little bit of a fight from my point of view as director, but also as producer, to um, to maintain a certain quality of shooting, so that we, you know, the ambition for me was always to make a film that would screen in theaters, that could go to film festivals, and would be a theatrical film about theater, as opposed to, uh, you know, just television or, or you know, that kind. I wanted to try and give it some of that sort of cinematic, uh, sort of theatrical uh, scale and scope and, and quality, really. So. Um, yeah, I'm not going to throw any real figures out at you, but uh, but I've, I'm very pleased with with we came in under budget. I'm very pleased with with what we got for what we spent. Uh, were there members of the cast who were planning to be in the stage production who may have backed out when they found out about the documentary nature? Um, no, there was no one. There was- there was no. I mean, I think by the time they found out with the docu- documentary production, it was too late. They were already in the play. So, uh, but I, but I don't think anyone felt that strongly about it. I think everyone, understandably, people were a little bit, "What's this? And what's the angle? And what's it for? And all of those things." And uh, you know, I hope that my crew and I approached that sensitively and, and sort of you know found a way through it. But there was no real, there was never really any protests out. And I think once people met us and understood where we were coming from and understood that we were trying to tell a story about theatre, uh, and it was sort of, in a way, this film, I see it for me, you know, having spent three years at the Old Vic Theatre as part of the company, for me, this is a bit of a love letter to theatre. It's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's a very positive and affirmative uh, uh, film about the process and the the craft and the, the hard work and effort and the, the family and the company that goes into making it. So... I think people understood that, uh, you know, eventually, and, and sort of got on board, you know. And, and um, uh, I'm really pleased with that. I'm really pleased with the film. It doesn't have a cynical bone in its body. It's not salacious. It's not trying to get out there and be some sort of, you know, poke, poke prod people and, and make fights happen. And I think once once the cast and crew, who are already exhausted touring around the world doing this work, uh, understood that, then they kind of relaxed a little bit, and it wasn't so much of an issue. Was there anyone who? Uh shown more in the documentary than they did in in the actual stage production? Anyone whose personality, for example, uh, came out for you that maybe uh, they were not as prominent in in the actual production of Richard III, but they they made a bigger impression actually in the documentary? Well, I I mean, in in a way, yeah, in the film, you know, there's there's sort of two, you're sort of moving through two timelines simultaneously. And there's sort of two stories being told simultaneously. One is the audience arriving and the curtain call, you know, and, and we sort of travel through one night of the play, essentially, with the company in the theater doing that work. And so that's part of the journey. And then the other sort of timeline is the, is the tour over the course of a year where they start out in London and they, they finish in New York and, and, uh, and everything in between. So... It was what we did in the film, I and mean, there's so many stories to tell. And the truth is, every single one of those company members, uh, you know, was was a remar- it was kind of an embarrassment to riches for a documentary filmmaker. They were just remarkable company people, and uh, and so they all shone beautifully and brilliantly in their own way throughout the tour, and each night on stage in whatever role they were playing. Um, I think. For the film's purposes and in trying to sort of tell all these stories, 
what we did is really, you know, uh, the arc of the company is the arc of the, the year-long tour, you know. Uh, and then there's a few characters like Gemma or Kevin or one or two others whose work on stage we, we explore a little bit more. Uh, Annabelle, Scully's another. You know, so the, so the, the, the character, it's, it's, it was just such an interesting tapestry to try and cross-connect, really, the individual human being with the character they were playing, the adventure they're on through the year with the company, how that's all working, and then the story they each, the ritual and routine they each go through through the night, every night of the play. So um, so really, you know, uh, whether it be Kevin or Sam or the cast, I, you know, uh, here's me turning up to this collection of remarkable storytellers, really, uh, trying to convince them to let me tell their story. And I, and I felt a sort of huge burden of, uh, you know, responsibility in that. You know, uh, someone like Sam, Kevin, Shakespeare, you know, all these, all these <laughs> amazingly talented and brilliant people. So that was a big sort of, it was very important for me that I, that I not only represented their work, you know, uh, fairly in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right way, but that actually also represented them as people. And so, you know, so each of the cast members, whether it's Gavin, who's, you know, uh, sort of young, possibly the youngest in the company, to, to Gemma and Maureen, who are at the, the other end of the spectrum, you know, to try and give everyone a, a chance to, to be themselves in the film and to, to sort of get to know them a little bit in the film and, and their part in this sort of remarkable Rubik's Cube of, of characters and talents that, that Sam had had sort of woven together for uh, for for the tour. Um, I, I hope they all are happy with the film. I think they are, and, I, and one, some of the nicest compliments from them uh, is that they really felt that the film kind of captured, somehow captured, the essence of of what they were as a company and the experiences they had on the tour. Well, and of course, if they didn't like the film, they still got to walk away with a, a, a replica of themselves as a bobblehead, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, but thankfully, I mean, I don't, none of them have told me that they didn't like the film. I think I've had, you know, maybe, they, maybe there's a few of them, but there you go, yeah. And so now you know that I watched all the way through to the end. Um, so obviously, obviously, uh, you've got the, the three years on your resume at the, the Old Vic as associate director. I'm sure you have more theatrical experience beyond that, you know, in the, live theater. Did you bring a, uh, like a, a bucket list to this documentary, the things that you wanted to really capture uh, in the wings of a, of a live production, and uh, you know what were what were some of those, and what were some that you just weren't able to capture, if there were any? Um, really, you know, I mean, one of the things that was very important to me was that you know was that this film and the people in it and the work, you know, that I got out of my I got out of the way, and that it sort of spoke for itself. So. The, the things that I want that I felt were important from my experience and from my as a, as a as the director and and sort of the stories that I was interested in telling that were sort of the less apparent stories the sort of wider themes uh, which were which were really kind of the, the the biggest the ones that were the biggest challenge I think to try and to try and make it in a, into a film one was that that notion of these twenty plus people who don't know each other coming together and by the end of the journey they're on sort of forming this sort of company. Uh, uh, my own experience of being in a theatre company had lent me to see when it works, and it doesn't always work, but when it works it could, it's quite a special thing and, and amazingly this company really were a shining example of that. The other thing that was really, I really wanted to try and find a way to express in the film but slightly across purposes to even making a film, is the, in the, the sort of power of live theatre. I mean, why do people go into uh, these halls or these theatres, sit in front of a stage and watch this stuff play out? What is it about that experience that is different to film or playing a PlayStation or doing something on your phone? Like, why is that so compelling? And, and why is it really one of the most sort of, you know, fundamental art forms that we have? Um, so, so that idea of trying to communicate the moment of theatre, the, the liveness of the fact that this is happening, this story is playing out from under your eyes in flesh and blood once only in the moment. And because of that, I think Sam describes it very well in the film, but because of that, when you're there with it, you know you're seeing this for 
the one time only. And you sort of the experience is richer and heightened because of it. And I think that potency of live theatre, when it when it works, when it all comes together, which which can you know we've all had the experiences of sort of you know numb bombs on the seat, but when it does come together, which I think it did in this production, it's uh, it's quite a special experience for the audience. So to try in a film to communicate that was 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 one of the big sort of goals for me on this film. Um, but yeah, sorry, go on. No, I'm, 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 I was going to say, you did not want it to make it just a film about Kevin Spacey on stage, and obviously there's there's plenty of other people and other storylines throughout and, and things going on, but I suspect because uh, Kevin Kevin is a big star, obviously it's the name that's drawing people to watch the documentary, was there a lot of stuff left on the cutting room floor? What are we missing on the cutting room floor that would further charm us? Uh, or, or uh, engage us about Kevin Spacey. What kind of moments uh, did we not get to see, just you know, for time reasons, for example? Well, well yeah. I mean, there is so much that goes into uh, editing something like this together, and and there were so like the edit was. I knew it was going to be such a huge part of it, and ended up working with a remarkable editor, Will Snodarek, to to sort of do the final edit on this film and. It, it was we had we shot a lot of footage. I mean, we were traveling for a year. Every night at the theater, there's this sort of repeated ritual, and we we're capturing elements of that. You know, each of the different cities, the backdrops of this. You know, and and then in the in the actors alone, I think we did two interviews with almost each one of the cast, and then some of the crew. And that's that in itself is like fifty or sixty hours of, of material. So there was a lot of stories to be told. Uh, you know, countries, theaters, characters, uh, individuals. Uh, Shakespeare, the play itself, you know, all of those things. So to try and, you know, and in some ways, like when we were creating this edit, myself and Will, we saw saw it as a bit of a multifaceted gem. I mean, one minute you're backstage in the middle of a scene and somebody's walking on stage, the next minute you're, you know, you're on the Great Wall of China. So to be able to dance between all of these elements of the stories was was a really a, a beautiful piece of editing I think from Will's point of view um, what was left out there was a couple of lovely there was so many things you know so difficult always for a director you have these things you, you love and these moments that you really want to tell but for whatever reason in all of the other stories and the connection so there are some uh, lovely sort of uh, I guess deleted scenes or, or extras that were that are available. I think I think they're available with the DVD if you buy the DVD, and I, I also believe if you download the film, which is on nowthefilm.com, you get um, you get you can download these. It's probably about forty five minutes of extra stuff, and there's a lovely there's one that I love in particular, which is just about the company, and it's sort of again it, it tells that story. There's one on Kevin, one on Sam, but if there was a moment in the whole endeavor that isn't in the film that I could put in the film. God, I don't know. Um, I don't, there's so many; it's impossible to say. Really, you know, there's just there's a, there's a, there's countless countless moments. There's also countless moments that we never caught on film. You know, there was. I remember very early on thinking, you know, if I could edit the conversations I'm having and the things that I've sort of seen this film would be remarkable because of course you, you're off duty and you're having a drink with someone and you're chatting and you're d- so that so but I think all of that plays into when you do eventually sit down in your interviews. But uh but yeah, that was a, something you should invent that for the for documentary filmmakers. Just like I don't know, whatever it is that you could you could download your memories and uh, your, what you've heard and seen and uh and cut them together. It'd be quite an interesting process, I suspect. <laughs> Jeremy, this is going to sound silly, but uh, could you turn the profile to your right for just a second? Yeah. Okay, folks, I'd just like to get some feedback via email. Does anyone else think that Jeremy, when he turns with the green hat and the beard, looks a little like a young Fidel Castro? That's all. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's kind of... <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm a, I'm a, uh, you'll, you'll see the video uh, later, and maybe you'll see why I asked that. I'm a huge fan of, of Cuba and uh, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, and rum and the odd cigar. So why not? There you go. Maybe we just get you a well. Anyway, uh, so okay. So you've got this done. This is out, uh, and we'll tell people in a minute where they can where they can get the film uh, and see it. Uh, what's next for you? What do you, what do you got up next? What are you doing? Um, yeah, no, this is out. We had a great run in cinemas with Now, and it's great. It's, I think it's coming to Netflix soon. Uh, beginning of February, it's available on Netflix, so I encourage you all to check it out. I'm really hoping people will see it on Netflix as well. And, 
Uh, and, and you know those fans of House of Cards as well. It's, it's sort of another Netflix world. But uh, come, next, I'm, I'm actually speaking to me in Mexico. I'm here at the moment, sort of over the past two years, between the sort of cracks of, of now and that project, which took most of my attention. Uh, I've been working on a project down here and uh, various other sort of parts of the world, which is it's sort of it's 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 a film about what I'm encountering as a sort of emerging sort of global community uh, and a sort of com- global consciousness really against the backdrop of of uh, of a world in increasing crisis. Um, so it's it's a project that sort of in some ways reflects a lot of what was in now. Uh, I'm looking at the the festival world. Uh, and various festivals around the world, huge, big kind of tribal gatherings uh, like Glastonbury in London or in UK, in Glastonbury, UK, or uh, Burning Man, smaller festivals uh, around the place. French and there's a sort of uh, Burning Man in Nevada in the, in the US, a number of others. There's another festival next month which I'm supposed to go. And the idea of these sort of conscious festivals and these, these places, the project's titled Sacred and Profane. And what I'm encountering is inside of these worlds is a community of people emerging who, who uh, really have a certain shorthand, uh, who sort of acknowledge and recognize. And I, think it's, I think it's something that I'm encountering reflected in everyone I speak to. I'm sure you can relate to it yourself. I mean, I think the veils are slipping somewhat on sort of organized religion and the sort of economic crash and what the hell is actually going on anymore. Uh, and so I'm exploring communities and cultures and, uh, and people who are, who are looking for other ways to, 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 to play the game, really. Uh, I'm currently in Mexico. Part of that story for me is what the, the ancient Maya had to say on the whole thing uh, in their stone and in their, in their calendars down in Mexico. So I've been exploring that since 2012, and, and that's led me then into these festivals and this sort of you know international community that seem to be increasingly conscious increasingly aware and uh, you know incre- increasingly uh, uh, sort of evident I mean uh, it's, it's amazing to me I being a huge fan of, of I'd be very interested in in sort of uh, you know uh, I guess some people call it perennial philosophy or, or sort of ancient wisdom really for a long long time and it's very interesting to me how many you know I used to bore people with it for years and now every other person I meet is sort of full of questions and fascinated by it so exploring that and, and, uh, and meeting some extraordinary people doing it and, and the project is, is sort of beginning to take shape now that now is done I have a little bit of time to, to really focus on that and edit so, so that's what I'm working on at this very moment and a few other things going on but. so will you call the new film <laughs> then? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, possibly. <laughs> uh, you know, the, I no. I, I think I think it'll be. I think it'll actually have a lot of similar themes and a lot of similar um, uh, resonances. But but actually, it'll be a very different film, and it'll be uh, exploring a very different world, really. Um, you know, but uh, but I haven't quite come up. The title, the working title, is the sacred and the profane. So. The idea that you can have this, like, sort of on the surface, sort of madly hedonistic, sort of sort of party world, but yet within it, somehow it brings everyone closer together, sort of similar to a theatre company, uh, in a way that there is a sort of understanding and acceptance and acknowledgement of, of everyone's sort of uh, more sacred side, you know, and and, uh, and there's a sort of spiritual. Weirdly, this combination of, of sort of festival and party and spirituality is something that's very interesting to me. Well, when you're done and it's uh, it's out in release, come back. Talk, talk to us about it. We'd love to. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you, uh, this movie. All right. And, uh, folks, it's been good to see you. And next time, next time I'll bring a Havana cigar from Cuba. You do that. You, I'm sure you were, you're in Mexico. I'm sure you have access to them now. Um, folks, uh, you can see Jeremy Wheelahan's uh, new documentary now in the wings on a world stage uh, on Netflix by the time this uh, airs or you can also order it right now uh, you can download it on Amazon or you can order it as a DVD uh, from Amazon uh, right through Mr. Media if you're watching us on MrMedia.com uh, either to the left or to the right if you look you'll see the cover of the DVD uh, for uh, now and you can click on it and have it instantly as download or uh, I understand they can get it to you in 30 minutes or less via drone so you know you got that um Jeremy, is there a website for the film or for your for your production company? 
Yeah, you can find the film and the trailer, and you can download it as well from uh, nowthefilm.com. Uh, and uh, you'll find me and my work at treetopsproductions.com. So okay. either of those. And are you, uh, are you a Twitter or Facebook guy? Can people find you on social media? Yeah, uh, uh, to Facebook, sort of work Facebook is Treetops Productions also. Um, there's also Now the Film on Facebook, uh, at Now the Film on Twitter. Uh, and I'm there as well, Jeremy Whelan, at Jeremy Whelan on Twitter as well. If you want to come and say hello, I'll be here. Very good. Well, uh, Jeremy Whelan, uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mr. Meaty, today, and uh, really enjoyed the film. I hope other people will uh, as well. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really pleased you did, and it's been lovely talking to you. This is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Weekday mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com. The George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. This is Snake. Do you read me, Otacon? Loud and clear, Snake. Did you listen to the latest episode of the Gaming Marathon on the Realm Network? Of course. They really know their stuff about gaming, especially that Usid guy. Yeah, but that Chirac guy is a real jerk. I don't like him. Regardless, the reviews are spot on and they tell it like it is. That's for sure. What, what happened, Snake? Were you spotted? Nah, it's just Lil Melser crying about the O's again. Ah, uh, whew. Close call. I better continue the search for Metal Gear, but keep listening to the Gaming Marathon each week. You got it, Snake. New every Monday afternoon right here on the Realm Network. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said that they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. And what you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WAVA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. These are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. <laughs> Just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. Resistance is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.